Okay, so just let me very briefly uh, recall that Luhmann's theorem, which is sort of the perfect version of the uniqueness of purification of a unitary saying if you have uh, two purifications of the same state, then you can get from one to the other just by acting with a unitary on the, the unifying, uh, uh, on the purifying uh, 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 system. And we're going to use that to prove the impossibility of quantum bit commitment. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, concepts like, like commitment, so very briefly, a commitment, uh, a lucky like commitment scheme as a digital analog of putting a massive or a big because commitment scheme into a, a vault and then revealing uh, uh, this message uh, later so that it has the following characterizing properties. The hiding property ensures that as long as they don't open the vault, I mean, you don't get to see the message that is inside, but on the other hand, the binary property ensures that once the vault is on the table, I cannot change my mind anymore. Once I decide to open the vault, I may decide not to, but if I open the vault, then you're ensured that the message that you get to see inside is the message that I had originally put into uh, the vault. A bit commitment is a very important cryptographic primitive, uh, it's used in all over the place in crypto, so of course you want to know to what kind of, uh, what level of security that we can achieve. And it's not too hard to see that uh, classical bit commitments, so in the classical quantum setting, we cannot have unconditionally hiding and binding bit commitments. So these two nice properties that we want to, to be satisfied, they actually, actually exclude each other in the unconditional setting. It's not too hard to see. Like informally, uh, for a bit commitment scheme to be unconditionally binding, it means that the information that Bob holds must determine the message that is sort of committed upon that is inside the vault. But if, if, if it is determined by the information that Bob knows, then at least in principle can of course contribute it. Now this argument doesn't work in the quantum setting, because even if the message is determined by the quantum state that Bob holds, it's not clear that you can actually compute this message. Because the only way to extract the information from the state is to perform a measurement, and the internal measurement doesn't provide you all the information about, about the state. So there was actually optimism once we had uh, invented quantum key distribution that we can also do quantum bit commitment, several schemes that were proposed uh, in the late 80s, but all of them were broken in the end, the wild was exactly not possible. And the impossibility proof is actually pretty simple, so I want to sketch it here uh, for you. So let's take a, a potential candidate scheme that, that we hope might uh, give us a quantum bit commitment scheme. And now we're going to look at the joint state, joint state of Alice and Bob, the committer and the verifier, after the commit phase. We think that Alice and Bob honestly follow the commit phase. Uh, uh, look at the joint state after the commit phase in case Alice honestly committed to a zero and in case, in case Alice honestly committed to one. Now we can argue that without loss of generality, we may indeed assume these states to be pure. So it's an assumption I made implicitly by writing them as, 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 as a state vector. I want this to reason a bit that if Alice or Bob use sort of non-pure actions that we can purify, I don't want to go too much into the details, but I mean it is an important step of the impossibility proof. But I don't want to focus on that. Um, okay, so now the hiding property says that Bob's view of, of these two states, or Bob's view, should be more or less the same in, in one or the other case. So in case of perfectly binding, uh, in case of perfectly hiding, the hiding property means that Bob's part of, of these two states should be identical. And in case of statistically hiding, that the Bob's part of his reduced density matrix, technically speaking, should, should be closed. Uh, um, <clears throat> but that's an exactly uh, uh, where Luhmann's theorem steps in. So now we have two purifications of, 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 of Bob's state. So we know that we can get from one to the other by acting on the part of the state that Alice has under her control. But then, of course, this opens the door for Alice to cheat. She can just 
honestly commit to a zero so that their joint state after the commit phase is, is, is this here, and then you can either honestly open that state, uh, the, the commitment to zero, just following the Google protocol, or she can change her mind and, and apply this unitary that, that, that acts on her side only to get from this state to the other, which is the state, the same state that they would get if she had honestly committed to one, and therefore, obviously, she can honestly open the commitment to one. And this, therefore, proves the impossibility of quantum bit Okay, uh, let's get back uh, to theory. Okay, so what I want to do now is the following. So far, we've carefully distinguished between classical information and quantum information. Like quantum information, the polarization of a photon, which is described by a state vector, or now with a density, density matrix, for instance. And classical information, like sort of the measurement outcome, the thing that you get to see on your measurement device, and, and when you measure a quantum state, and usually capture this just by writing some sort of element from some set here. Now what I want to do is I want to use the quantum formalism to also talk about classical information. So that classical and quantum information are not two distinct concepts anymore, but classical information is just a special case of quantum information. And the way I'm going to do it is, is as follows. So I mean, I start with, with a finite non-empty set, and, and I understand an element from that set as, as classical information, but now I want to use the quantum formalism to capture this classical information. We do it as follows. So choose a Hilbert space of suitable dimension, a fixed orthonormal basis of that Hilbert space, where I label the basis vectors by the elements of this finite set, and then just identify, identify such an element from the finite set with the state that is described by this corresponding state vector here, or if you want, you can also describe it by the, by the density matrix. Yeah. Note that holdings of the classical piece of information, holding the classical x, is equivalent to holding the quantum state described by the state vector x here. Why? Well, I can just recover the classical x by performing a measurement on that quantum state here. I can just measure that quantum state in that basis and it will give me the classical x back. But it's really equivalent uh, 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 to, to use sort of this quantum formalism to capture classical information. And it will be very convenient to have sort of one formalism that captures not only quantum but also classical information, as you will see. Now this extends naturally to the case of randomized classical information where we don't have sort of a fixed piece of classical information but sort of something randomized because I can just then course look at the corresponding density main because I mean first I, I go from, from the uh, uh, right of the classical the randomized classical information as a randomized quantum information but I know how to take care of randomized uh, quantum information by means of the density matrix formalism completely by writing down this density matrix by taking this complex linear combination of these uh, uh, randomized pure states. And I can even go further and describe sort of a hybrid situation when I have randomized classical information and quantum information that depends on the classical information using this quantum formalism. I can capture such a complex situation and a bit sort of annoying situation to write down this way just by means of one big density matrix like this. But this big density matrix expresses now using the quantum formalism that I have some classical x that appears with probability px and I have some quantum state that is then described by this density matrix from x here. Which is very nice because it's a very neat, compact mathematical object that now describes this sort of complex uh, situation. Now, let me apply this to a particular example, sort of the important example, uh, 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 when we measure a quantum 
stay because that is the that's situation where we observe classical information in a randomized way and we still have to post measurement states of the state which the measure quantum state collapses. <clears throat> now so far I would have written or captured this with the following text, I mean that I observe a classical X with this probability, the probability here is given by by, by um, <coughs> Born's rule, and that the state that I've measured collapses to this thing here. But now with this formalism that I introduced in the previous slide, I can just capture it again as one big density matrix. Okay, so describe this information here by this density matrix here. Now plugging in choices for Px, rho x, up here noting that the Px uh, cancels out, I actually get sort of this very nice compact description of, of, of what happens when you perform a measurement. Again, this is of a description now where we need, or much neater than before, mathematical description of, sort of this physical action of performing a measurement. Okay, now I'm going to further rewrite this expression, and you'll sort of see in a minute why I actually want to do that, because uh, it's going to look less nice the way I rewrite it now, but uh, then you'll see the main why I want to do that. So I can rewrite it as such a sum of, yeah, I call that sandwiches of, of rho, uh, meaning that I have something acting on the left of the row and, and it's a joint acting from the right uh, of rho and sort of a sum over such sandwiches. There's some additional thing that you can work out if I put sort of these sandwiches the other way around, with no row in between, and add them up, I'll, I'll get the identity. It's not that important as to understand that actually but why this works. Huh? <coughs> the important is uh, that I can write sort of the situation after the measurement by this sort of density matrix here, including the classical measurement outcome and sort of the, the, the state in which the quantum state has collapsed. All this information is sort of captured by, by this sum over sandwiches of the throat. Okay, now, for now I just use this sort of motivation to write down a, a general definition. So I call a map E that, that maps an operator to another operator, or matrix to another matrix. I call such a map a CPT map, and the terminology will become clear later. It will also be referred to as a quantum channel or general quantum operation. If it is of the form as we had on the previous slide, if it maps a, a, a matrix R to such a sum of sandwiches so far where I want to have this additional constraint that if I put this, the layers of the sandwich upside the other way around and add things up, I get the identity. Okay, sure, can, can I down such a definition? We've already seen one example, namely performing a measurement can be captured by such a CPT map for, for specific choices then of, of, of these EIs. So we've seen one example of such a CPT map. <clears throat> um, you've seen other examples actually. Um, applying a unitary uh, uh, is also a CPTP map. So, for a special case where the, the sum so it just boils down to one, I mean, there's only one term in the sum, you note that sort of this property is satisfied because u dagger u, by definition of, of unitary, is its identity. There are other examples. <clears throat> Going sort of from, 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 a, from a quantum system to, to a bigger system by sort of appending another system in some fixed state, so formally written like this, uh, is, is, is also a CPTP map. So, like I'm in the head sort of a quantum system, and I well, next to it independently prepare some other system in some fixed state, and I will look at the joint system, also this action I can describe as a CPTP map. And last but not least, another example that we've already seen is actually CPTP map and the partial trace. Sort of the opposite of going into a bigger system and going to a subsystem by sort of throwing away part of the system, not looking at the other system anymore, putting in the rockets and it to the moon, 
never can encounter it anymore, also this is captured by CPTP. I mean, maybe not fully obvious, but it's not, not hard to, to, to work on. So this means, I mean, they sort of pretty much capture, not only pretty much, they really capture everything that we can do with a quantum system. Apply unitary, we can go into a bigger system, apply unitary there, we can throw out part, we can perform a measurement. Everything is captured by ACPTP method. And vice versa, you can see that on the next slide also, uh, the, 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 the converse holds. Every CPTP map actually corresponds to a sequence of these elementary operations that we can apply to a quantum system. So really, CPTP maps is the mathematical object that describes the most general quantum operation that you can apply to a quantum state. But the most general evolution that the quantum state may undergo is mathematically described by a CPTP map. Um, so for the, the, the backward direction of this claim, Paul uh, follows from this uh, characterization theorem for a CPTP map, which states that a, a, a map E is a, a CPTP map in the sense as defined on the previous slide, which is sometimes also referred to as the Krauss representation of the CPTP map if and only if it is completely positive and trace preserving, so I'm only mentioning that sort of thing to say where the CPTP comes from, it stands for completely positive trace preserving, doesn't matter that much what exactly it, it means. More important for us will be the other uh, equivalence uh, relation that it's a CPTP map if, if it has the following so called Steinspring representation. Now, you don't even have to bother to look at this sort of a complex uh, way of writing this down, just look at this big picture here. So, E is a CPTP map if it, can, if it can be sort of implemented by the following sequence of elementary quantum operations. We take our quantum system, we go into a bigger system by comparing two additional systems in some default state here, so I wrote here zero, it doesn't mean they have to be bit states, they can also be bigger systems, but compare them in some default state. I apply a unitary to this big system, and then I throw away, or I trace out part of it. Again, very informally, the CPTP map, every CPTP map is the following form, take your inputs, Think of it as a quantum system. You go into a bigger system by preparing additional systems in default state. You apply a unitary to the whole thing, and you throw away part of it, and you keep part of it, and take this as out. So every CPTP map is of that form, and vice versa. Everything of that form, so seen that on the previous slide, is a CPTP map. Okay. Um, Anne already talked about no cloning. And uh, she's proven that no cloning is not possible by means of uh, unitary transformation. But you can do more on the quantum state than applying unitary transformation. You can go to the bigger system, you can perform a measurement, you can throw out part of the system. So, I mean, what she's proven doesn't really show that, 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 that no cloning is not possible. Only sort of shows no cloning is not possible in that less expressive formalism of pure states and, and unitary operations. Since the most general operation that you can apply to a quantum state is that this is a CPTP map, I mean, we have to prove that it's not possible to clone a quantum state by means of a CPTP. That's what I'm going to do now. Um, so the statement, the formal statement is the following. Let E be a, a CPTP map. Uh, so representing the general quantum operation and I take two states, psi, phi and psi, and then the following holds if E applied to phi produces two copies of phi, and E applied to psi produces two copies of psi, so E succeeds in cloning both phi and psi, then either the phi and psi are the same, either we're just talking about one single state, I mean, copying one single state, I mean, this is actually possible because I can just 
prepare this state over and over again, or the two states must be orthogonal. And indeed, of course, I can copy orthogonal states. I mean, if, I, if, I, if I'm given a state and it's either this one or that one, then my task is to copy it. Well, what I do, first I perform a measurement to distinguish, first I perform a measurement that tells me which of the two states it is. If they're orthogonal, I can do that. I can just measure sort of the basis that is given by those two orthogonal vectors. And then again, when I know what the state is, I have to clone them, I can do that. So this, this proves that only orthogonal states can be copied. I know that orthogonal states can be copied, but as soon as we're talking about non-orthogonal states, they cannot be copied. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not going to go through the proof line by line. Essentially what we use is we're going to use Steinspring's representation of, of CPTP in maps, which pretty much brings us down then again to the pure state formalism with, with uh, unitaries. Uh, um, <clears throat> and then we're back in, in uh, Anne's case. So uh, yeah, we'll not go through that line by line. But let me mention that so the main ingredients of, of the proof, which allows to reduce the proof to the case that we've already seen in Anne's talk, is Steinspring's representation of CPTP map, but also the uniqueness of purification. And if you replace of the uniqueness of purification by so its approximate version and its good ones theorem, then we get a bit of a stronger result that says that not only perfect cloning is not possible, but also approximate cloning is not possible. I mean, formally the statement will be that if you have a CPTP map that manages to clone to vectors phi and psi approximately, so that they get approximately two copies of phi here and approximately two copies of psi here, then the two states must either be close or almost orthogonal. Okay, um, again, back to theory. There's sort of one last concept that I want to introduce and, and briefly discuss in my lecture here, and that's uh, a, a distance measure for states. So I'm going to introduce a, a distance measure for states that will have sort of the nice property that it tells us how similarly or not two states behave. So that has the properties of the property that you would expect from a distance measure, but yeah, you have to find one that really satisfies this property, that if two states are close according to this metric, then they behave in a similar way. If they're very, very close according to this metric, they behave essentially the same way for all practical purposes. And if they're far apart according to this metric, then they may behave very differently in the sense that under certain actions they do behave very differently. Okay, so the Distance measure that does its job is the so-called trace distance. I'll first start introducing a trace norm. Um, so the trace norm of a general permission uh, uh, operator is just the sum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues of, of the permission matrix. The permission matrix has a full set of eigenvalues. If we count them uh, with multiplicity, we count them with multiplicity. And the trace norm is essentially just the one norm, the usual one norm of the list of eigenvectors of the, the matrix of the operator. Um, if we take a, a density matrix, now a density matrix, the eigenvalues of a density matrix are non negative and real, it follows from the positivity of the, of the density matrix, and they add up to one. Trace of density matrix is one that the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. So the trace norm of the density matrix is always one. So applying the trace norm to density matrices is not very interesting. <laughs> Things become interesting when we apply the trace norm to the different matrix we get when we take to a density matrices. I mean this then of course gives us a, a metric, a distance measure. Uh, um, which we call the trace distance. Now there's some normalization factor here, but that's not so important. Okay, so far it's just the definition. Now, first thing to know is that if you apply this trace distance to two density matrices that capture 
classical information that captured to, to classical distributions, right? Yeah, as I've explained, thrown this quantum formalism on, on classical information, uh, then the trace distance boils down to the statistical distance of, of the underlying probability distributions. And you may or may not uh, may or may not know that the statistical distributions has sort of this property that I want for classical information, that the statistical distance has the property if two probability distributions are close with respect to the statistical distance, then they behave uh, similarly, they can get hard to distinguish them if they're far apart with respect to the statistical distance, then they're easy to distinguish and they behave very differently. So on the sort of classical sub set of, of, of quantum, so to speak, the trace uh, distance behaves the way it's supposed to be, but uh, yeah, I'm going to argue that, that on all uh, 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 quantum it behaves that way. Which pretty much follows from this theorem here, uh, which states that if I have two density matrices describing two quantum states, and yeah, I can sort of now measure the distance using the trace norm, when I apply a CPTP map or any CPTP map to these two density matrices, then the trace distance can only get smaller. So by acting on two quantum states, they can only get closer to each other in terms of this, this metric. Now one way of acting on a quantum system is by performing a measurement. If I perform a measurement, I just look at the classical measurement, I look at the, at the, the post-measurement state, then I'm talking about classical information here, and in case of classical information, I've argued on the previous slide, then trace distance coincides with the statistical distance, which I've argued on the previous slide is sort of the measure that tells me how well I can distinguish the, the measurement outcome. And so from this, and then because I have, I mean, if I apply this theorem to this particular CPTP map that describes the measurement, and from this upper bound here, again by what I've explained on the previous slide, we immediately get that this trace distance upper bounds how well I can distinguish uh, two quantum states and uh, the following proposition which tells me that there exists a measurement there exists a measurement for which I have equality here rather than sort of inequality which holds in general there exists a measurement so that I have equality here so this then implies that this trace distance here captures precisely how well I can distinguish two quantum states. Uh, how, how well I can distinguish uh, two quantum states, which is what I want. Um, so yeah, let me just prove this, this proposition here as, as sort of the last part of my lecture, because uh, it's quite similar to, to a proof that I've done uh, well, the first part of the lecture, I think. So again, the measurement that, that does the job is the measurement, this is the rank one project of measurement that is given by an orthonormal eigenbasis of the difference matrix. And I just claim for now that these measurements can do the job, so I'll have to show that this is indeed the case. So I'm going to look at, at so essentially the left hand side here, uh, well, times two, so that I don't have to carry the factor one half around which I've argued is the statistical distance between the two probability distributions by Warren's rule, the probabilities are given by those two expressions here and now again it's sort of rather straightforward standard calculations I use the linearity of the trace to write this, uh, well, as, as this difference of traces as a trace of the difference matrix I use the defining property of the trace that turns this outer product here into an inner product. I use that this vector here is an eigenvector of the difference matrix. Get this here, and I use that this inner product here is one because we're talking about normalized vectors here. So I do get the sum of the absolute values of the eigenvectors of the difference matrix, which was by definition the trace distance of the two. Uh, density matrices. 
Okay, so this pretty much uh, concludes my lecture. Just let me summarize uh, kind of the, the, the take home message of, of this lecture. Um, important thing to realize is that we have mathematical formalisms that describe and tell us how they behave uh, uh, quantum states and quantum systems. And depending on the context, we may use the state vector formalism, which sort of easier to think about and to deal with, but it's less expressive. It doesn't work, I cannot use it in all the cases. Or we can use the density matrix formalism, which is of more general, but also a bit harder to work with. Uh, in either case, we have mathematical rules that tell us how the state behaves under different operations, ranging from unit operations to sort of throwing away part of the state, or not being aware that there is some, some other part of the state. Um, an important concept is purification, that a mixed state can always be understood as, as part of, of a pure state, can always be sort of understood as part of a bigger thing, but what makes it mixed is that we don't have access to the, to, to the bigger thing, and, and the uniqueness of purification is important applications uh, in quantum information processing. You see one example in the impossibility of quantum mechanisms. Um, we can capture classical information using our formalism for, for, for quantum information, which uh, allows us to somehow describe complex situations with certain probability of observe some classical measurement outcome and the quantum state collapses to some post measurement quantum state, just as one sort of big uh, density matrix, just as one nice mathematical object that we can work with. Mm. Um, you've seen that CPTP maps are sort of the mathematical object that describe general quantum operation, that describe the most general evolution a quantum state may undergo. And I've quickly introduced the trace distance, which is in many cases, not always, but in many cases, of the right distance measure to use because it captures exactly uh, how similarly two states behave or not, how well we can distinguish two states. Okay, with that, I would like to thank for your attention. It was a happy day, I'm sure, so I <laughs> hope you have a relaxing and quiet evening and are back with full of energy tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you.